Uh, last but not least, let's go to our final guest, uh, somebody I consider a friend, known him for a long time, George Nemphos, founding partner of Nemphos Brow. George uh, is a founding member of Mid-Atlantic Boutique Law Firm, uh, representing entrepreneurs, startups, emerging and mature companies, as well as Veriture Capital and private equity funds. George, why don't you give us a little 60 second on yourself and uh, we'll take it from there. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me today. Always happy to be a sponsor and be on with Jay Moore and to see your smiling face. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, Nephis Brow was formed by a bunch of former big firm lawyers, um, unlike, not unlike David. Um, we tout ourselves as big, big firm expertise, boutique service. It's kind of our tagline. Um, you know, having spent uh, a majority of our careers in large firms, uh, we experienced uh, what a lot of lawyers experience at these monolithic firms. You know, you're a number, you're a cog. You don't really get an opportunity to really sit down and help your clients. And I started out back when it was Piper Marbury, went all the way through to DLA, was a partner, left, became head of corporate internationally for a firm. It was just being dragged all over the universe, literally. Um, and the thing I missed and the thing that my partner, Tim Brown, missed was the ability to really have one-on-one -on -one interaction and actually help a client. I mean, really be in there and help a client deal with day-to-day -day issues and feel their pain and help them uh, build something and be a part of it. And one of the things that we really work for is to sit down with our clients and transfer, transform their legal costs into a value set for them by you know, trying to craft a unique legal solution for their business. So that way, when they come to us and they work with us, they feel a partnership. They don't feel like they're going to get into a cab, the, the taxi cab driver is going to click the meter and think they're off to the races and then it's over, the meter gets clicked off, pay me my money and they're gone. So, you know, we work with entrepreneurs, you know, all of our clients, irrespective of the size that they're at in this stage in their company's life or their business, there's an entrepreneurial feature. So we work with startups, two guys in a, uh, or one gal in a garage working on and watching them grow and build and helping them being legal advisors, all the way up to them being half a billion dollar companies. Um, you know, our clientele are not only in the mid-Atlantic region, but you know, it's led us to having relationships with entrepreneurs and entities that are doing business all throughout Latin America, Asia, and Europe. So it's been interesting times for us with uh, COVID and everything going on and seeing actually some backlash business-wise uh, for some of our clients doing business abroad, being American companies uh, during, uh, during these times. But it's uh, been a tremendous experience. Um, you know, I... Uh, I spend my time at the big firms. Everybody actually at our firm is former big firm lawyers and decided to get out, get away and actually be a part of something. And having become an entrepreneur myself, we feel a lot more kindred spirit with the entrepreneurs and understand a lot of what they're going through. And through that, as you mentioned, it's everything from formations to seed rounds, venture capital, private equity, mergers and acquisitions and, and so on. George, let's pick it up with COVID, actually. Um, things have changed, obviously, for everybody. What are some opportunities that, are, that you see uh, during COVID, maybe that weren't in COVID before? You know, people have ideas, they start to think about things. So what's been happening in terms of opportunities for business in terms of COVID? That's a good question, Gary. Specifically, if you looked at industry by industry, I think everybody recognizes, acknowledged, and I believe I saw Dr. Rifkin on uh, the, the video today, um, telemedicine, digital therapeutics, um, enhanced software and uh, uh, ERM systems, which enable the provision of healthcare in a more efficient way and a better way to protect lives and provide better care is exploding. Yeah, the I think we've all seen the adoption of telemedicine has become enormous and it's here to stay. You know, there were times where before COVID, there were discussions about utilizing telemedicine to provide services. And everybody was like, now, nah, if I can't talk to my doctor and I can't see them, I don't want to do it. Now, 
everybody's grown more accustomed to it because they didn't want to go anywhere. And they certainly didn't want to be somewhere where there were sick people. Telemedicine's become enormous. So I do believe that through COVID, we're going to see massive advancements and are seeing the start of these advancements and how technology can help deliver more effective healthcare to not only the day-to-day -day individuals, but to help and protect our more elderly population, especially in nursing homes, as well as assisted living, geriatrics, just generally being in a situation where we can learn from what's happened, take what we've learned and develop it for future generations and better provision of you know, services. You know, we've also seen massive advances in, um, in consumer products. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, anti, you know, disinfectant, antibacterial soap, that kind of stuff. I'm talking about actual delivery of, of consumer products. You know, the food industry early on in all of this um, really got hurt and there were mad runs on beef. We were hearing about poultry farms having massive outbreaks. You couldn't get your Charmin. I mean, you would have think that we were in the middle of a snowstorm again here in Baltimore and you couldn't find Charmin or milk. Um, <laughs> But what that did was expose our issues with our supply chains. So now we're seeing advancements and opportunities in how to make our supply chains better, how to make them safer, how to make them more cost efficient. And there's going to be industries that are exploding in that area as well. George, let's, let's flip that actually for a minute. You know, when COVID started, if I just take a look at the stock market for a minute, all the technology stocks shot up. Everybody working at home, Zoom, Apple, you know, you name it, all these technology stocks. Um, but now that COVID is coming, hopefully, to a close soon, and with the interest rates rising, things are starting to flip. Technology's valuation is starting to come down, and the cyclicals are starting to come back up again. So my question to you in terms of what you do is, are there any, any industries that you're familiar with that suffered during COVID, which now that we're about to reopen, may come back again? That's a great question also, Gary. We, we do a lot of work in industrial services, and in business services. And I can tell you anything that touched infrastructure during the pandemic really struggled. You know, if you were a, a, a company that serviced construction, um, uh, gas and pipelines, uh, oil refinery, um, you know, things like that, that was in a commercial setting, they all got shut down. Everything got shut down, it stopped. And so they really suffered. But now that the cycle's coming back and we're starting to feel like we can get back to work and these things, and we need gas, we need oil, we need our roads to be fixed. We're seeing those companies come back into play and their revenue cycle is spinning back up and their backlog is increasing exponentially, which interestingly enough has now sparked the M&A market in those yeah. industries big time. We are seeing professional money private equity funds, mutual funds, going for, you know, what we call a roll-up, where they're acquiring a bunch of these companies, packaging them together to be an even bigger company. So we are seeing that happening, and we are seeing the spin-up. We are seeing, you know, a lot of money being thrown into the food industry, especially clean food. No, You know, that was a, listen, let's face it, years ago, we all said, well, clean food, what are you, allergic to, uh, uh, to, to dairy? Um, today, <laughs> It's become a big thing, and the multiples in the food and uh, beverage space that is clean are through the roof. So we're seeing the markets, as you as you stated, where they took a dip. They kind of went into sort of a hibernation. You know, maybe they didn't go all the way down, but they level. They went down and leveled off. I think what you're seeing in the technology space is an acceptance that we need this technology and everybody's using it. Like, look at us today. We're still on a Zoom, you know? I mean, we're not up on a stage giving a panel, you know, waiting for the bar to open. Um, we are, you know, we're still going to have these things and it's going to continue on. But what you're seeing is a correction in the marketplace and a leveling off because now everybody's using Zoom. They're using team meetings and there's so many other platforms that are coming live that are more specific to certain industries that, you know, you've had this big spike, it's coming down, it's going to level off, and that innovation will be spread into other areas, such as telemedicine and other things that, you know, we'll see it equalized. George, what about um, SPACs 
uh, talking about the market. SPACs have kind of put IPOs on its head here. You know, um, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing, what you feel, uh, maybe even define what a SPAC is, if somebody out there may, may not be familiar. So a SPAC is a special purpose acquisition corporation. Events, what they basically are is a shell public company that goes off and buys companies that are supposed to be within a certain um, industry. industry. Yeah. But, you know, here's the dirty secret about a SPAC. The dirty secret about a SPAC is, is that they generally drop 30% after, you know, on the trading value after their first acquisition. It's true. I mean, you will hear it from people who do SPACs. They, they drop in value very quickly. Um, and then you've got the whole um, positioning of how to take these pieces that were acquired that supposedly have synergy and turn them into an actual operating corporation that's utilized and can build continuous value. It's not an easy thing to accomplish. Um, so I think you probably even heard recently the SEC has announced they're going to start taking another harder look at SPACs. And SPACs, the reason yeah. why is because they drop in value so fast. Nine times out of 10, there's always a little bit of an issue with the companies they actually acquire. And, you know, they're a hotbed for securities law litigation. You know, people lose their shirts with SPACs. So, you know, we have several clients that have been approached by SPACs. I don't do SPAC work. Those years are long gone for me. Um, I try to avoid doing public company work. We do some work for public companies, but I'm not doing their public company securities work. Um, but what we're seeing is a lot of people who have been approached, they, they immediately, the hand's going off. Any sophisticated company today is approached by a SPAC that feels that they have, have other avenues to secure financing or an exit strategy is not going to go with a SPAC. They're just not. So, George, what you're saying is, A, you're not a real big fan of SPACs, number one. Number two, the regular investor is probably going to be left holding the bag while the originators of the SPACs continue to make a bundle. Absolutely. <laughs> gotcha. Hey, let's get back to the quote-unquote real world for a second. A guy's got a business or a gal's got a business. And uh, they've had it for quite a while. Maybe they're thinking of a succession plan. Maybe they're thinking of getting out, selling, whatever. How do you begin to value a business? And how maybe has COVID, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, been with those principles? In other words, has COVID affected the principles of valuation? Yeah, I would. I mean, you, we addressed it a little earlier. It depends upon the industry market segment you're in. Because there are some industry and market segments that actually saw the multiples that that acquirers were willing to pay for businesses to increase, while in other sectors for a long time it was it was dropping. And as it was dropping, you had um, a big gap between what was wanted and what was being willing to be given. And then deal structures got really complicated and a lot of old tricks of the trade were brought back into play with earnouts, seller financing, all sorts of stuff to try to bridge that gap. Um, so COVID definitely, you know, caused some complexity in the marketplace. And then you lay over top of that, what industry are you in and what's going on in that industry and market segment? The act of planning, you know, what we did see early on in COVID and through the portion of it, you know, probably past a little past the midway point from where we are today, just this overarching exhaustion on the business owner. You know, I'm doing everything I can. I built this great business. It's moving forward. I was really doing well. COVID hits. Half my workforce has to be put on hiatus. I'm fighting to stay alive. You know, I've given a lot of talks about this concept of uh, economic herd immunity, about mm. corporations banding together and trying to work with each other within a sector. I mean, you really did feel it just became really tough. And for the, the entrepreneur and the business owner and even a family, own business, they really started looking in the mirror more and more. And they started asking, do I want to go through this anymore? I mean, I am, this has kicked me in the teeth and I'm cooked and I'm tired of fighting uphill. I'm tired of, of, of swimming upstream. This is just, this is just kind of coming to the end. So if you had somebody who's already starting to think about, you know, doing something and there's, you know, and from a succession planning place, maybe there isn't another family member or somebody within the business to take it over and run it. 
you know, their, their thoughts really started to go to, well, maybe it's time for me to find a buyer or at least get prepared for it. And there's a couple key attributes when you're talking about a liquidity event, a successful event that enables the entrepreneur and the business owner to say, I did it, I succeeded, I'm going off to, to sit on the beach. Um, there's a couple of things that still you need to do even during times like this, and that's get your house in order. The better ha your or the more orderly your house is, as we all know, when you sell your home, you got to stage it. You got to do that for your business. Mm, you clean it up, paint it, do what you got to do, throw some carpet on the floors, take down all the photos of your dog, <laughs> and try to make it look something where somebody would come in and see themselves there and taking it over. And so a lot of that goes into that's when you bring in your lawyer, make sure your accountant's been around. And start to take a hard look at what you've been doing. Scrub the numbers. Scrub the legal structure. Take a look at your contracts. Get your house in order and build yourself a defensible baseline from which you can set your valuation. Um, that's always been the case. And I think even more now with COVID, it's even more important because there's still a lot of companies out there that would be great buys and could have great exits, but they bootstrapped it. They ran it like it was coming out of their kitchen still, and they haven't taken that time, okay? The market is very hot right now in m and in certain markets, in certain industries, but it's bleeding across the board. So we're seeing a lot of activity. People refer to it as frothy, like the ocean turning up and the waves are hitting and you start to see the foam. So, you know, I think COVID has made, has heightened the awareness to the warts and the, that you know you have as a business and the skeletons in your closet. So it's really important to take the time to address those issues before going to market. Ooh. If you go to market with those issues, you're done. You never you you can't go back. You know once you've been out and everybody sees the warts, and everybody see, you know hears about the skeletons in your closet. It's hard to shut that closet door. It's, it's hard to go to the dermatologist. People already know. So, um, you know, COVID has definitely put a big old flashlight on those issues. The other thing COVID, I would say, has put a big flashlight on is how did you handle the company during the pandemic? Did you have a team that was capable of reacting to the situation and able to crisis manage through the pandemic? You know, um, that's got a lot of value to it, too. You know, and, I, and finally, this concept of herd economic immunity. I mean, you know, we've all heard of, that, of herd immunity, you know, and everybody argues it's 70%, it's 80%, what, whatever it is. Herd economic immunity, the concept is, is that people within a marketplace, within an industry line, work together in different sectors to try to bolster each other's businesses. Your supplier is working with you as a buyer, you know, as a manufacturer to ensure that you have what you need and understands that you are also scrambling to get cash to pay the supplier. The supplier tries to work with you to ensure that you are getting what you need so you can produce product and pay him. You are working with the supplier, with his suppliers, to ensure that he's got a pipeline of stuff by committing to buy. By working together, were you able to work together? And did you utilize this time to build stronger ties within your industry marketplace in order to bolster your business coming out of this, potentially leapfrogging it over your competitors because you've got the better relationships because you did the work during the pandemic to build those relationships. That's a really big thing. Those are really big items that will affect your valuation and will affect whether or not you have a successful exit and do it and will also affect whether or not you're able to continue the business on through succession planning with your children or with your brother or your cousins or whatever, because you've helped make sure this business stayed stabilized and was yeah. strong coming out. George, unfortunately, our time is short, but how can people get in touch with you uh, personally if they are interested in this topic, which I'm sure many people are? No, I appreciate that, Gary. I mean, the easy thing to do is go to our website. It's memphisbrow.com. It's a mouthful. Um, it's uh, N-E-M-P-H-O-S-B-R-A-U-E.com. Um, that's our website. You can read about us. We've got some case studies and some videos and our contact information is on there as well. 
you know, we're always willing to help and listen. Um, you know, we, we understand, you know, people with a dream and we also understand people tr fighting to stay, you know, around. Yeah. And uh, we're, we've been lucky during the pandemic. We've been lucky before the pandemic. I'm sure, knock on wood, cross my fingers, we're going to be lucky after that we've had the opportunity to work with some really amazing entrepreneurs and families and helping them, you know, realize where their, you know, their dreams and what they're trying to do. George, always a pleasure personally and professionally to be with you. Thank you so much. You too, Gary. Thanks again. All right. You got it.